The Goat Man travels in the shadows of our broken lives, in the places we dare not look. The Goat Man travels. While we sleep, he feeds on our nightmares, our dreams, our desires. The Goat Man travels when we are alone, when we feel no one is watching, when we are most wicked. He watches, he observes, he smiles. The Goat Man travels through the inner workings of our soul, through the cracks in our fractured being, through the world unnoticed. The Goat Man Travels. The Goat Man by Immortal Alexander. Armed with pointed horns and glowing red eyes, the Goat Man stalks the wooded areas in several regions of America. But how did these urban legends come to be? Why a Goat Man of all things? As with many legends of the United States, this one seems to be influenced by similar folklore and depictions brought over from the old world. Join us tonight as we open the barn doors and wander into the darkness to find this spooky sheep on this devilish episode of Snipe Hunt. Welcome, you are listening to Snipe Hunt, your frightening folklore podcast. I am your horned host, Darren Young. And I am your horned up host, <laughs> Gary Clevenstein. That's not what I wrote. <laughs> I <know. laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> and I am your hooved host, Gary Clevenstein. I know, kind of like yours better. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> Tonight we are diving deep into the history and lore behind a recently popularized urban legend. The grisly, ghastly, and grotesque Goat Man. Goat Man. It's October. It is October. So that means it's officially spooky season. Woo! Darren's favorite time of My year. My favorite. And so our episode for the months reflect the spookiness like a malevolent mirror. And Goat Man is certainly a good kickoff for this slight shift. Dude, I, I get so basic. <laughs> Once it hits October, I'm like... Oh my God, it's spooky time. <laughs> Got to grab my PSL from Starbs and get some pumpkins. You do have, you do have a new like uh, costume every year. Oh yeah. yeah. My favorite by far still is the um, Fallout type. The gas mask thing? Yes. Yeah, that, that was, was cool because yeah. it lights up. Yeah, <laughs> it nice. it does look really cool. But yeah, I, I get these all from Etsy. So they're all like custom made masks and stuff. And you can't find them in stores, which is why I like because I don't. I've never looked at Etsy. You should. It's that's where I get a lot of stuff. Um, that's where I got my crystal for the crystal episode. <laughs> oh. And uh, I'm excited to dress up this year like I do every year. I'm excited to perform on stage with my band in costume. That'll be fun. Speaking of things, I will be doing for October. I will not be doing a Halloween stream this year, but I will certainly be doing a Halloween reading like I did last year. Uh, last year, if you remember, I read The Hound by H.P. Lovecraft, and it actually got a surprising amount of downloads, so I hoped everyone who listened to it actually liked it. Wait, did we do the... Did we do the... No, it wasn't f October when we did the Phasmophobia, is it? The stream? That, that's what that's was. Was that was. Yeah, it's, it was Halloween Day. That's been a year already? It's been a year already. Holy crap. I'm keeping this year's story a surprise, and I'll either post it on the night of October 30th or early Halloween day. Like I said, my band does have a show on October 30th, so we'll see. Uh, and I'll be wearing that goat mask. How appropriate for this episode. Now, we say the goat man legend was recently popularized because the hit YouTube series BuzzFeed Unsolved covered the subject and his cursed bridge three years ago. This is likely their most viewed video with 20 million views and put the series on the map. It's actually a really great show. You should really check it out. It's I hilarious. Like, I love BuzzFeed. I, I, I like some BuzzFeed stuff. Um, most of it I don't like. Um, it's just a little either straight up lies or... <laughs> but BuzzFeed Unsolved is definitely an exception. Uh, but this will be their last season. They actually started their own channel, so they'll be unaffiliated with BuzzFeed very soon. Um, so it's very likely that you've heard of this horned heathen before, but I assure you that is only the very tip of the iceberg. The iconography of the goat man goes back further than you think, perhaps even to the dawn of mankind. And before you say it, Gary, no, 
the goat man is not a product of a lonely farmer and a seductive goat. At least not in most origins. Says you. <laughs> the goat man, sometimes called the sheep man, is a human goat hybrid creature who originates from the urban legends of many U.S. states such as Maryland, Kentucky, Texas, and others. According to the lore, the goat man usually hides out in the woods, often carries an axe, and seeks to kill pets and scare local teenagers who encroach on his territory. Encroach. Yes. Encroach on his territory. Hmm. So he's after pets. He, he's he's going to get them. <laughs> Hi, Joe Pets. Hi, Joe yeah. Teens. His origin story often varies depending on the region. We'll go through the extensive history of the iconography of goat-human hybrids, discuss a few legends throughout the country, and end with some spooky campfire tales about this creepy caprine. Caprine or caprine? Caprine. Which is, you know, like a horse is equine, Ah, a goat is caprine. Yeah. Okay. I I had to search for that because I was like, I know there's a name for it. (laughs) Now, as we mentioned a couple of episodes ago, the goat man is not to be confused with sheep squatch. Although similar, the goat man is decidedly more humanoid. And whereas sheep squatch is a true flesh and blood cryptid, the goat man is a being of many paranormal hats. Which is weird because he has those horns. So you think the hats wouldn't fit, but they do. He is the uh, the the uh, costume of choice when murdering people in movies. Yes, that or like or like a pig mask or a pig. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, yeah, you're right. When I used to work at a haunted house, and one of my favorite masks there was a goat mask, and so I got the goat mask. I got the chainsaw. Was, that was fun. Yeah, it's good night. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so before we get into the various modern urban legends about this character, let's go way back to the roots of the goat man image. We'll start at the very beginning. In ancient times, horns were considered a symbol of power and authority, and as a result, there were various horned deities. From the bull-horned gods like Hathor of the Egyptians and Pashupati of the Hindus to the antler-sporting Kuranos of Celtic and Gallo-Roman beliefs. Moses himself, although not a god, was said to have horns upon coming down from the mountain with the Ten Commandments as portrayed in Michelangelo's Moses statue, although this might be due to a mistranslation of the book of Exodus. So let's just narrow it down to the goat and ram deities. Uh, Ancient Egypt had several deities associated with rams, including Knum, or Num, one of the earliest Egyptian gods, Harry Shaf, (laughs) not Harry Shaft, it's Harry Shaf, Um, Kurti, Anjeti, Horam Aket, Baneb Jedet and Amun, a very complicated god who was later depicted as a goat like man when his worship spread to Greece and became the cult of Amon. All right, let's stay in the country of Greece for a while, as that is the real birthplace of the depiction of a half goat, half man like being really starts. Now, other than Amon, Greek as well as Roman mythology is famous for the fantastical creatures known as fauns and often incorrectly known as satyrs. Although in modern times, the names are often interchangeable for one another. So what's the difference, you may ask? Well, originally satyrs were more horse-like. These nature spirits were usually depicted with the body of a human, but the ears and tail of a horse. Earlier depictions often included horse-like legs, so not really goat-like, yet. (laughs) Satyrs are repulsive beings in both appearance and behavior. They had hideous visages, unkempt hair and beards and were almost always naked which made it hard to ignore their exposed and permanently erect penises. Yeah, that's my problem. (laughs) I think you should go to the doctor. (laughs) Uh, They were known as companions of the party god Dionysus and were known for attempting to rape nymphs or human women. So not not really good, but you know, uh, Greek mythology was complicated. And fauns were creatures from Roman mythology who had the head and torso of a human, but had the legs, tails, hooves, and horns of a goat. Fauns were typically friendlier than satyrs, often helping guide humans through the wilderness. Although Romans also believed that fauns had the power to incite fear within the hearts of humans. This was likely as many spooky woodland noises were attributed to fauns. Eventually, the concept of the Greek satyrs and the Roman fauns were blended together to refer to the goat-like humanoid. Now, you may be familiar with the Greek god Pan and his famous Pan flute. No. You don't know what a Pan flute is? No. It's that little thing 
It's got like a bunch of tubes and they're all tied together and each tube is a different length. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, see, so you knew what a pan flute was. Is, yeah. He is the Greek god of the wild, a shepherds and flocks and fertility in his identical to fawns in appearance. We get the word panic from pan as the mysterious sounds heard in the woods and fields were attributed to pan and they would cause contagious fear in humans and cattle alike. Now, a lot of Roman mythology is inspired by, if not just stolen from Greek mythology, so I always assumed that fawns were based on the god Pan. But it appears that the Romans had their own goat hybrid deity before they incorporated Greek mythology with their own. This god is appropriately named Faunus. How original. And Faunus had a female counterpart named Fauna, a goddess of earth and fertility, and that's where we get the word that represents all animal life, Fauna, as in flora and fauna plants and animals and they open a bakery that's where they come up with fondue <laughs> or oh fondant. yeah fondant those are those totally come from the same <laughs> <laughs> word origins actually you fond- know i was initially trying to be funny you know with the fondue <laughs> yeah and i thought wait a minute it's not a bakery fondant fondant is, is the bakery. bakery fondue is the cheese yes it's still both french so yeah you're right we, we've already talked about France in the time slip episode. So we're done forever. Now, it's pretty unclear who came first, Pan or Faunus, but based on my research, it seems that these gods developed independently from each other and were eventually equated to each other based on their similar appearances and values. But it is likely that they greatly influenced each other at the same time. So independently, but influenced each other, they both looked like a fawn or a goat man, if you will. Right. Now, let's focus on the more popular of the two, Pan. And I do mean popular. Although Pan was not a member of the Olympian Council of Gods, he was one of the most widely worshipped and one of the last gods of the Greek pantheon to be worshipped. Like satyrs, Pan was rather ugly and bestial in appearance and had a voracious sexual appetite. Although these attributes may have endeared Pan to the Greek people, it had the opposite effect for the followers of a newer, ever-growing religion, Christianity. Now, back to Moses really quickly. In the Old Testament, during the dawning days of what would become Judaism, the Israelites stood up from their neighbors as they did not have a true image of their God. There might have been exceptions, but the majority of these other religions, other than Judaism, had some sort of idol or other depiction of their deity. And many of these deities had horns. These gods and their idols were viewed by the Israelites as evil, since they were competing religions that might cause their own to stray. This was a huge deal, as the very first of the God-given commandments is... Thou shalt have no other gods before me. That's a good God voice. Thank you. Now, I bring this up as this might be one of the first associations between horned deities and the concept of evil. Now, back to the Christians. As the influence of Christianity spread, it of course conflicted with other religions. As in Judaism, the Christians view these other deities as evil spirits who stole sacrifices and worship from God. As Paul would write in 1 Corinthians... The sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have a part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. So he's calling out all these other gods. Literally. You can't have your cake and eat it too. Yeah, exactly. Choose one. You have to choose God or, or you choose these other deities. But if you choose these other deities, you're literally worshiping demons. Um, So Christians began to literally demonize these other gods in an attempt to invalidate their worship. St. Augustine of Hippos was likely the first to demonize the Greek god Pan himself, as well as the satyrs calling them incubi and succubi, respectively. As we learned in the Sleep Paralysis episode, these are demons of lust that appear while their victims are asleep and have sexual intercourse with them. Like I said, the Christians did not appreciate Pan's over-sexualized lifestyle, according to the lore. I have a question. Yes. My mind is Pan. Yes. I can't help but think of Peter Pan, which I know that's not <laughs> Pan's Labyrinth? Is that also Peter Pan or is that or is it a different Pan? It's uh Pan's Labyrinth. There is like a little fawn like creature in Pan's Labyrinth. Mm-hmm. I'm just, I actually haven't seen that movie. I've seen The Labyrinth with David Bowie, but I haven't seen yeah. Pan's Labyrinth. Well, I was just wondering because you you have said he's popular. Yes. No, literally I, I've never heard of him. I've, that's why I'm trying to think of where I know him, if I know him at all. Right. I think he might have been in Pan's Labyrinth because, like I said, there was a goat. Like, but you I've know, seen you've Labyrinth. seen the image of the half goat, half human before, right? Yes. 
Pan was pretty much the originator of that. Okay. So you see all of this in various media, and we'll get to it. Okay. No, 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 you're good. You're good. Because you're like, man, that's familiar, but I don't know yeah, why. Well, I'm just trying to, yeah. It's, so, okay. it's because he's, it, he, he's, he was so popular, his influence lasts greatly to this day. Theologian and alleged historian uh, Eusebius of Caesarea further demonized pagan deities and solidified the connection between Pan and the demons of Christian lore. The only physical description of the actual devil in the Bible comes from the book of Revelation, in which he was described as a dragon. But the association between devils and Pan had already been established before Revelation was added to the biblical canon in the 4th century. So already we're, we're equating demons with this goat human hybrid right. with the horns and the hooves and all that that explains the the future interpretations of satan yep yep yeah. exactly exactly right. uh the goat human hybrid depiction of demons really took off in medieval iconography artists were depicting all sorts of demons and devils and a great number of them were goat men previous subject krampus the christman demon was one such to go man on friday the 13th 1307 King Philip IV of France began the Inquisition of the Order of the Knights Templar. The Knights Templar were guarding a bad reputation around this time in history, so King Philip took advantage of this and started a witch hunt, likely in order to gain some of the land and wealth owned by the Christian order. During this Inquisition, the Knights were tortured and coerced into making likely false confessions to various charges like heresy, spitting and urinating on the cross, sodomy, and the worshipping of idols. Ooh. Yeah. Grievous charges back in the day, for sure. Like heresy? Oh, my God. I know. <laughs> Urinating on the cross? <laughs> uh, I can explain. <laughs> One of these idols was named Baphomet. Does that sound familiar to you at all? Uh, for a second, I thought he was someone you could uh, summon on Final Fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> he is, actually. Oh, is he? Yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> but that's where the name, where do you think they got the name Baphomet? Okay. Um, the name Baphomet was likely a corruption of Mahomet, an archaic alternative spelling of Muhammad, the founder of Islam. At the time, European Christians believed that Muslims worship Muhammad as an idol, although that's never been the case. So it is likely that the Knights Templar were being forced to confess to the idol worship to what they perceived as the god of their enemy in order to discredit their order so King Philip could take their stuff. So basically it's like, hey, confess to this so that you look bad, and then I have an excuse to take all your wealth. Yeah. And if you don't, we're going to torture you until you do. During these confessions, this Baphomet idol was described as a cat, a head with three faces, or a skull. It wasn't until the 1850s that Baphomet got his modern depiction. Alphaeus Levi published his work, Dogme et Retula de la Telt Magi. I like that. <laughs> Thank you, that was so bad. <laughs> I liked it. Dogma and Rituals of High Magic in which he included the image that he'd drawn himself showing a winged humanoid goat with a pair of breasts and a torch on its head between its horns. Oh, man. This image was later adopted to portray the Manor Arcana tarot card, the Devil. And then this image was later adopted as the official symbol of the Church of Satan. Hail Satan. Satan. And that brings us to today where the image of the goat man is synonymous with the Christian Devil. See, we got there. I gotta admit the... the Wow, he does have a nice rack, then. not he? <laughs> he, he? He indeed has a rack. They nice. had a statue of this that outside the uh, Arkansas Congress building for a while, and people were flipping out about it a few years ago. Really? Yeah, because the Church of Satan was just like moving it around just to piss off people, and I thought it was hilarious. Did you know the Church of Satan really isn't? Yes, I know it's not yeah. actually. Yeah. They don't actually worship Satan. It's, yeah. it's more like a, a parody of religion right. run by smug atheists. <laughs> Which no, I, I I like what they're trying to do, but they're they're also so like they're doing it wrong. <laughs> they're so like smug about it. Mm -hmm, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I I've definitely looked into it. It's uh, I do like this depiction of him better than the original. Like, cause why do they give him like those are awfully round boobs, man? Yeah, they're actual breasts. There's not like they're not like male pecs. It's yeah, fe female and male. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. And so you can see the little Elphias Levi where gotcha. he actually drew it. So yeah. this was his sketch. So he was actually a pretty good uh, sketcher, artist. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, there you go. That's that's where we get the Christian devil with the horns and the hooves and the pitchfork and little uh, devil tail came later, I guess. But, you know, the more you know. Yeah. <laughs>
All right, well, now we can finally get to the goat man of American folklore. Goat man! Yeah. There are several goat men in the United States. We'll focus on four. The Prince George County Goat Man of Maryland, the Pope Lick Monster of Kentucky, and the Lake Worth Monster and the Alton Bridge Goat Man of Texas. See, what's funny is pe when people talk about the goat man, they think their goat man is the only goat man out there when there's actually like at least a dozen. <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> but, just like which is interesting, but we'll, we'll get to the reasons why yeah. eventually. <clears throat> well, we will start with what seems to be America's first goat man legend. Dun, dun, dun. Something was killing pets and terrorizing teenagers in Prince George County, Maryland. Some said it was a crazy axe-wielding hermit secluded in the woods. Others believed it was something even more sinister. The Beltsville Agricultural Research Center, BARC, is located in this creepy county and sits on nearly 200 acres of land. Bark is what we'll call it, with a C. Bark specializes in creating new breeds of livestock, such as hogs that develop more pork on less feed, chickens that lay bigger eggs, as well as its famous Beltsville small white turkey. But with all these successful breakthroughs, one has to wonder, how many experiments failed? It's always what I want to know. Legend has it that a bark scientist whom some sources identify as Dr. Stephen Fletcher was conducting an experiment that involved the splicing together of goat and human DNA. Some say Fletcher was searching for the secret of eternal youth. Aren't we all? Others say the cure for cancer, yet others say he was a madman and did this for no other reason than for his sick curiosity. Whatever the reason, the experiment was botched and a goat-human hybrid escaped the lab as a result. That's <laughs> eight. <laughs> Some believe this poor soul was an unidentified human subject, while others believe it was the doctor himself who retreated to the woods and gained a lust for blood. Yeah, that sound earlier wasn't my cat. It was the goat man. This is the story of COVID, man. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of parallels, so... <laughs> Other legends claim that the Maryland Goatman is a demon conjured up through blood sacrifices by devil-worshipping followers of the occult. The county has something of a history with demons as the 1949 exorcism of a boy in the town of Mount Rainier was rumored to be the inspiration for William Peter Blatty's famous horror novel, The Exorcist, in 1973. Never heard of it. Yeah, me neither. Book or movie. The Goatman first made news in November of 1971. The story reported that local teen April Edwards and some friends heard strange sounds outside her home and saw a large creature walking in a nearby field. Soon after, the family puppy, Ginger, had vanished. I knew it. I told you they were coming after our pets. <laughs> Any puppy named Ginger deserves to vanish. <laughs> That's, I, I think Ginger's a fine name sure. for a dog. I'm just joking. Soon... April's cousins found the decapitated remains of the poor creature near the railroad tracks. Now I'm even, now I feel even worse. Yeah. Ginger's dead. <sighs> Come on, Gary, have a heart. I'm sorry. <laughs> Soon after, the goat man was spotted entering the woods near April Edwards' home. It was spotted again by yet another group of teens on nearby Zug Road and was described as a six foot tall, hairy biped that made a high pitched squeal before retreating. The Washington Post picked up the story, and soon the story of the Goatman spread around the country. Although it is likely that the puppy Ginger was hit by a train and not murdered by a hooved hominid, once the folklore fire ignited, it can be nearly impossible to squelch it. Or quelch it. Squelch Either one. It. Yeah. Are my uh, alliterations tripping you up? I just, I'm not good with big words. My hooved hominid. Smart, smart my words. My folklore fire. But yeah, so this is likely the first goat man. And it is likely that every other goat man in the country spawned off of it because, you know, have, newspapers picked it up all around the country. That would be a a big puppy if it got hit by a train just to be decapitated. <laughs> because if a puppy gets hit by a train, I have a feeling you're not going to know if it was decapitated yeah, or I not. Couldn't, I couldn't find what breed of dog it was, but, you know, it's got to be small enough for a goat man to pick up and carry off in one hand. I guess, but it has to be large enough to where <laughs> a train would simply decapitate Or maybe that was just the cover story because there was a goat man on the loose and they didn't want to incite panic. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> panic. Mm -hmm. Like pan. Panic. Yeah. yeah. Like I said earlier, that's where we get the uh, word for it. A lot of people try to say uh, pandemic, 
also comes from pan, but it actually comes from the Greek word pas, which means all. But I'm sure pan had some influence in the entomology of that word too. Huh. But panic for sure is from pan. So the more you know. <laughs> All right. So imagine you having this wall with all this this chart and you're drawing lines, <laughs> pans in the middle circle. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, pan, like I said, pan comes from pas, which means all. So pan is the root of everything, the root of evil, the root of all words. <laughs> and the final line goes to Kevin Bacon. <laughs> <laughs> Our next bleeding brute holds up in Louisville, Kentucky, and it is known as the Pope Lick Monster. This particular legend is perhaps the most dangerous of all the ones we're covering tonight, as this goat man has a body count and serves to warn off the possible dangers of legend tripping. For those not in the know, legend tripping is a visit to a location which has been alleged to have been the site of some sort of paranormal or otherwise horrific event and continued activity is often reported at these sites. So like when we went to the Crescent Hotel or to the ghost store and stayed the night there, that was us legend tripping. Oh. Legend tripping is often used as a rite of passage among young people, and such is the case with the Pope Lick Monster. The Pope Lick Monster is identical to other descriptions of the goat man, part man, part goat, and part sheep, too, apparently. So, you know, man, bear, pig, except sheep, goat, man. Um, this chimera also wields an axe and stalks teenagers that dare challenge him. The preferred lair of the monster is a railroad trestle bridge that runs over Pope Lick Creek in Louisville. This goat man mimics voices and uses telepathy and hypnosis to lure its victims onto the trestle, which is nearly 100 feet high and spans 772 feet across the creek. Once on the trestle, the monster jumps out to frighten the victim into falling or jumping off the trestle, almost certainly resulting in death. Or the monster uses its hypnotic powers to keep the victim motionless on the tracks until a train approaches and hits the unfortunate soul. So this goat man doesn't really like to get his little goatish hands dirty. He likes to, you know, the trestle of the train to do his work for him, apparently. The legend says that the monster is a circus freak, a survivor of a train derailment that occurred near the trestle, who carries a bloody axe and seeks revenge against those who mistreated him. They say he jumps down on the roofs of cars that pass under the bridge and attacks them with his bloody axe. Others say he is the ghastly reincarnation of a farmer who brutally sacrificed goats to the devil during his life. One legend even paints the trestle terror in a helpful light, claiming that the goat man appears not to kill people, but to warn trespassers about the oncoming locomotives. This dangerous trestle bridge became a hotspot for teens to test their mettle against the sheepish horror of the goat man, which is highlighted in the 1988 black and white short film, The Legend of the Pope Creek Monster, in which a group of teenagers visit the trestle and encounter the monster as well as an oncoming train. And I did watch this. It wasn't particularly good. <laughs> like, the, like I see what they're going for. They're trying to give it like an old 1950s PSA vibe. Uh-huh. But like, so I like that part where they're going for, but overall it's kind of just like a, a slog to watch. But let me pull up a picture of this trestle bridge so you can get, uh, get an idea. It's, so it's pretty high up and you, you can't see it right there, but the Creek is right down there. So it's even higher than what it looks like there. So yeah, pretty high up, pretty dangerous. That's like today. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. The, it's still there. Uh, this was a fairly popular real life activity, particularly around Halloween. Norfolk Southern Railway officials condemned the film as they thought it would encourage young people to visit the trestle. In the film, there were no casualties. However, this has unfortunately not been the case in real life. The surrounding hills and forests dampen the sound, which makes it harder to hear a train charging towards the bridge. Yeah, see, and this was the, this is before the TikTok age. Yes. Now, absolutely. Oh, yeah. You would have. No idea it was coming. There'd be people gathered there, like, as soon as somebody put this and it went viral. Because it said they were worried about... Yeah, that film, that film itself. Yeah, they're coming to visit the trestle. Yep, yep. And and it's still a fairly popular spot. Uh, In 1986, a high school boy fell to his death at the trestle just one week into filming the short movie. Oh. This caused the movie to change its tone to a cautionary tale and required a warning from the Norfolk Southern Railway Company for viewers to stay away from the trestle bridge. In February 1987, 17-year-old J.C. Baum was struck and killed by an oncoming train at the bridge. In May of 1987, 
19-year-old David Bryant died of injuries doing to jumping off the trestle, trying to dodge the oncoming locomotive. <laughs> and we're not done. In 1994, a man drove his ATV onto the trestle. The ATV overturned and pinned him to the tracks, resulting in the man being killed by a passing train. Several other deaths also occurred in the following years, 2000, 2015, and even as recent as 2019. So, no surprise, locally, it has become known as the Trestle of Death. Yeah. No surprise there. Although we here at Snipe Out love to legend trip and plan to again soon, please stay away from the Pope Lake Trestle. Your life is not worth a goat man sighting. And also just general legend tripping tips, please get permission before going on anyone's private property, and please take the proper precautions if you're going anywhere remotely dangerous. This has been a Snipe Hunt PSA. The more you know. If Even if we did go and legend trip that, I'm sorry to the family of these, peop the, p these people's families. Yeah, it's them. tragic. But you're, it's a train bridge yes. that is just wide enough for a train. Yes, and it's 770 feet long. So if a train's coming and you're right in the middle of it, you're done. You can't outrun the train. Your only other option is to jump off, which is also going to result in your death. And there a scene like that in Stand By Me? Yes. Is it Stand By Me? Yes. Or is yeah. that the, am I thinking of. I think it's Stand By Me. Or am I thinking of the one with the, the vampires? The Lost Boys? The Lost Boys. No, I think it's Stand By Me. You're right. I've never seen Stand By Me, but I've seen the Family Guy parody of it. <laughs> and that happened to the Family Guy. And they're Guy on a parody. train. They're on a, a trestle bridge. And yeah. the train comes and they have to. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. When did Stand By Me come out? It was. Um, Stand. 90? 1986. Oh, is it 86? Yeah. Okay. So around the same time as, you know, the the Popelik film and uh, huh. the legend of the Goatman exists even before that. So maybe there was some inspiration there. But I'm sure that a trestle bridge is all over the country. Our PSA <laughs> goes for any trestle bridge, even not including the Goatman. Like, come on. Or just anywhere where you're, you're going to legend trip. Just get permission. Take yeah. the precautions. If it's out in the middle of nowhere, make sure you have stuff to get you through the middle of nowhere. All right. Anyhow. Our next legendary creature seems a little fishy. We go down to Texas to meet the Lake Worth Monster. Yeah, now you can finally do your southern accent. Yeah. <laughs> On July 10th, 1969, the Fort Worth Star-Telegram published an article detailing an encounter a local couple had with a savage beast. John Reichart and his wife were parked in their car along with two other couples at Lake Worth. Suddenly, a large creature jumped onto their car. This bizarre being had patches of greasy fur as well as scales and resembled something between a human and a goat. The scaly goat man tried to grab at Mrs. Reichart through the car window with its long taloned claws, but John drove off before the creature could touch her. The couples immediately reported the incident to the local police who investigated the scene of the attack but could not find hide nor scale of the offending scaled mam ma mammalian. <laughs> mammalian. Ma -ma mammalian. The police did find a long, jagged 18 inch scat. Scatch. <laughs> scat. Skip it up. up. <laughs> Skip it up. Boom. The police did find a long, jagged 18-inch scratch down the side of the couple's car, which John claimed was the goat man's doing. That's one way to get insurance covered, I guess. <laughs> it was the goat man. A police dispatcher reported to the telegram that they had had reports of the creature coming in for months, but always assumed it to be a prank. Patrolman James McGee seemingly... No, I thought of Ass McGee. You know that show on... <laughs> Is it on? I know what you're talking yeah. about. I've never watched it. <laughs> Patrolman James McGee seemingly no longer thought this was a joke as he was quoted in the telegram saying, We did make a serious investigation because those people were really scared. Although McGee theorized that the perpetrator was a foolhardy prankster in an ape suit and said that pranks like these are dangerous as someone is liable to get themselves shot. The most Texas thing ever. But then again, we're in Arkansas, so someone was also liable to get themselves shot if they're running around in AIDS around here. More sightings follows as many residents trekked over to find the fishy fiend. On July 11th, Jack Harris saw the goat man crossing a road near the lake, and a group of 30 people saw the beast walk up a nearby bluff. When the group approached, the monster hurled a discarded tire at the crowd, which caused them to scatter and retreat. 
Police recalled and chuckled at the report until they heard an eerie howl from the nearby woods. <laughs> the last sighting occurred later that year in November, in which Charles Buchanan was asleep in his sleeping bag in the bed of his truck by the lake. He was disturbed from his slumber by the goat man who lifted Buchanan into the air. Buchanan quickly gave the creature a nearby bag of leftover chicken. The beast accepted this offering and swam away into the lake heading towards Greer Island. <laughs> he just wanted some chicken. Yeah. Jeez Louise. <laughs> That's what I do. I go, I go to a Chick-fil-A and I pick up a worker. I'm like, give me the chicken. Charles Buchanan was high AF. <laughs> That's why he had a bag of chicken sitting by him <laughs> in the bed of his truck in the middle of the night by a lake. <laughs> Based on the description of the creature, 300 pounds, whitish gray fur, and bipedal, the police still thought this was the work of a daring prankster. Man, 300 pounds. Oof. It's a beefy goat, man. man. Local shop owner Alan Plaster claimed to capture a photo of the beast, and his picture shows a large, vaguely human-shaped white fuzzball with horns. Given the photo was taken back in 1969, the quality is poor and uh, not very convincing. So, here we go. But yeah, there he is. It just looks like a big cloud. It's vaguely human shaped. You can kind of make out horns right yeah. there, a little bit. And it would be about three hundred pounds. It right. definitely doesn't look like anything you would typically see out in nature. Though. You know what? Though that actually looks a hell of a lot better than I thought it was gonna. Yeah, it doesn't look terrible, but still, it's very grainy. I mean, given well, yeah. nineteen sixties, but you know. But I mean, if you look at all the folklore pictures out there, man, that. Is the most convincing one. I've really? Seen. Yeah. It just kind of looks like a giant, like I said, a giant cloud with horns or like someone stuck a bunch of cotton balls on his character. Yeah, but like you can like, well, I guess because I've been 300 pounds, I know like, like see, he definitely like looks 300 pounds. Man boobs, his gut. <laughs> yeah. Man boobs right here. The, gut right here. He's got a hell of a jawline. Yeah. I like that jawline. And of course I'll, I'll post this picture along with uh, several yeah. others on the social medias. Even though this said that it's poor and not very convincing. I, I don't think it is. <laughs> oh, you don't. I disagree. Well, there you I go. Well, go it. go on the social media. So okay. I'm going to post it on Facebook and Twitter and judge for yourself and then let us know. Is yeah. this convincing or are you team Gary or team Darren? You have to decide. <laughs> Since the goat man summer of 69. I purposely put it like that. Yeah, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're welcome. Since the goat man summer of 69, several people have come forward as the alleged pranksters responsible for the sightings. An anonymous 2005 letter claimed that the author and a fellow student dressed up in a gorilla suit and a tinfoil mask in order to scare residents around the lake. The tinfoil mask might account for the scales described by John Reichardt. A man named Vinzens took credit for throwing the tire at the crowd. Lakeworth officials claimed that the encounters were due to a pet bobcat that escaped nearby and was fond of people, and so jumped on their cars. You know, like how cats do. Yeah. Reminds me of I this. actually said that with a skeptical tone, but then I thought about it. I was like, oh, yeah, cats do They actually do, <laughs> they, yeah. they do that oh, all yeah. the time. <laughs> yeah. Like, you've never went out to your car and there's freaking muddy paw, paw prints, prints all, all, over. all over. Yeah. An anonymous kennel owner came forward later saying an escape macaque. 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 <laughs> it is a macaque. Macaque monkey was to blame <laughs> for these incidents. We're 12. Uh, <laughs> blame, um, okay. Never mind. No, oh, I'm going to move on. Although it should be pointed out that neither of these animals match the size or the description of the monster or macaque. <laughs> so the bobcat or even the macaque monkey, it's not very convincing as if we saw the picture. Right. A, a macaque or a, or a bobcat doesn't look like that. No. And then the thing about uh, hoaxers or alleged hoaxers. So like, say, Patterson Gimlin film. When it came out, everyone's skeptical about it. And then it's the first person who comes out and says, yeah, I hoaxed it with the guy, but I have no way to prove it. Everybody's like, oh, yeah, we automatically believe you for unknown reasons. That's what pisses me off because it's like if you're going to – people are hoaxing this to get attention. Right. Well, guess what? Maybe it wasn't hoax. Maybe there are people coming out saying they hoax it so they can get attention yeah. <laughs> because it's a famous thing. So if you hoax something, show me the proof. The famous picture of Nessie, the little black and white photo of the head sticking out of the water. That was a hoax, and we know that for sure. It was because, a man on a horse, wasn't it? No, no. Oh. It was uh, two dudes. They had like a little remote, remote control submarine thing, and they oh. mounted like a Nessie head on it, 
and they drove it around. Oh. And we know that because they're like, here's what we used to hoax it with. They oh. provided evidence. I'm just so tired of people like, oh, we hoax it. And everybody's like, oh, okay, we automatically believe you. <laughs> Dude, I've said it a million times, man. Play Among Us. Play Among Us. I do play Among you, Us. Yeah. Well, that game truly shows you mob mentality. Oh, yeah. Like, like seriously, like, it's just human beings as a whole. Like, as long as you're the first one to come out and say something usually oh yeah people already jump on it people jump yeah. on it yeah they like, get behind it, you it's unreal <clears throat> but then there's people like me who say stuff and nobody you know <laughs> no, no one yeah, listens no, to it. no one listens dude to we it. were playing a game that was almost it was like have you ever played mafia where you lay your head down and you had to put your head up if you're the mafia and then kill uh -uh. someone well it's similar it's similar to that and like every time it was basically that but someone was the werewolf and every literally every single round i'm like this guy's the werewolf and every single round no one no. would believe me <laughs> and then every single round that person was a werewolf right. i was getting so pissed off <laughs> i don't know if you're into childish games like i am because of my son but yeah because game, of your there's son a game, there's a game on roblox oh god that's like that that that's like you're talking yeah yeah it's it's, it's fun anyways the Fort Worth Nature Center and Refuge now hosts a Lake Worth Monster Bash every five years with activities like hay rides, guided hikes, canoeing, and cryptozoology presentations. That'd be fun. Yeah, I think the next one's not until like 2024, so. Oh, blame Which is weird because they, they hold it on a five-year rotation, yet they won't do it like 2020, 2025. I mean, obviously, they couldn't have it last year, but right. they last had it in 2019, so they're next going to have it in 24. 24. Which is the OCD meme. It just bugs me. Yeah, just hold it in 25. And then yeah, just hold it in 25 and then go to 30 and we'll be right. fine. But yeah, I just thought this one was interesting because, you know, he had scales <laughs> for some reason. <laughs> Bridges have long been seen as thin places between our world and the world of spirits. And as such, legends of haunted bridges number in the thousands. Old Alton Bridge in Denton, Texas is no exception. And it is home to the ghost of the goat man. Uh, the bridge was constructed in 1884 and crosses over Hickory Creek. This narrow one-lane truss bridge was originally built for horse-drawn wagons and is no longer in use for automobiles. According to legend, Oscar Washburn was an African-American goat farmer who lived near the bridge in the 1930s. One fateful moonless night in 1938, a group of bloodthirsty Ku Klux Klansmen broke into Oscar's home and drug him out to lynch him. They brought him to the old Alton Bridge, tied a noose around his neck, and hung him over the side of the bridge. The lynch mob then heard a splash, and they looked over the bridge to find that the farmer's body was gone without a trace. The tension of the noose may have decapitated the farmer, dropping his headless body into the cold creek below. The Klansmen then immediately returned to Oscar's home and murdered the rest of his family. Ever since that night, a human-goat hybrid creature haunts the bridge and stalks the woods around it. Some say that Oscar Washburn's decapitated spirit returned from the grave, but was unable to locate what he had lost. So he tore the head off a goat and wears it in place of his own head. What did that goat do? He was there. He had a head. <laughs> I'm getting headless horseman he vibes. He needed a head. Uh, like the Trestle Bridge at Pope Lick, the old Alton Bridge has become a popular ledger tripping site for local youths, especially around Halloween. It was said that if you drove across the bridge at night with your headlights off, or parked on the bridge and honked your horn twice, you would see the glowing red eyes of the goat man staring at you. Like I said earlier, however, the bridge has been closed to vehicles for 20 years, so can't exactly do that anymore. Um, the bridge has been visited by its share of paranormal investigators, including the Ghoul Boys of BuzzFeed Unsolved Paranormal, as I mentioned earlier. F*** you, goat man! Holy s***! Is that you're, good? I thought you were going to build your way up. No, 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 I just right out of the gate. Why build up? As well as the Association of the Study of Unexplained Phenomena, or ASUP. ASUP's mission, according to their site, is, quote, to research and study all paranormal phenomenon in the pursuit of possible proof of individual survival of human personality after death and to help support the efforts of similar organizations that end and to educate the public to those findings. That's exactly how they wrote it. So I'm, if it did make sense, not my fault. <laughs> uh, the ASAP team visited Goatman, Goatman's Bridge in 2007. It witnessed a strange glowing orange cloud float by the bridge, as well as a misty person-shaped apparition. Unfortunately, or conveniently, 
These incidents were not caught by their tripod-mounted cameras, but the legend of this woolly wraith remains nonetheless. And also the Ghost Adventure crew went there, I think this year, really recently, but I decided not to mention because it it's just more Zach shenanigans where he's pretending to be possessed and he's like choking himself and being a dick to his coworkers and <laughs> classic Zach. <laughs> now that we've explored the legends, let's tell some true tales about this furry fiend. This is Spooky Stories. Spooky Stories. Man, we haven't had a spooky story section forever, it feels like. Excited. Perfect for Halloween. This first one comes from Reddit user Dead LS Better. This is literally the easiest Reddit username we've had. Dead is better. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Dead is better. And it is titled My Encounter with the Goat Man. Did you hear about Goat Man? The summer I turned 10, scary stories were all the rage. My friends and I had recently been introduced to Are You Afraid of the Dark by way of a later bedtime, and as a result we spent the next two months trying to outdo each other with terrifying tales. This included snippets we heard from older kids, shit we made up ourselves and embellished stories from the news. Just about anything we thought would freak each other out, we'd make a story out of. That particular afternoon found us sitting on my porch, indulging in a rare treat from the Mr. Softy truck. Set among the sound of cicadas and the smell of baking grass, we were trying to squeeze every last drop of our summer vacation before we started fifth grade. Goatman was a particularly popular tale in our neighborhood, but I had never heard much more than the name. Not really, just that he's supposed to live in the trailers behind the tracks, I said. A long time ago, there was a man with legs that looked like animal legs, who had hooves for feet and he had a tail. He danced in the freak show and, and when he got too old, he left and moved into the blue and white trailer right behind the crabapple tree, Robbie said while trying to keep his ice cream from running down his hand. If you sneak up to his trailer at night, you can see him dancing, but if he sees you, he'll chase you home or worse his sister Shannon said. My brother said he takes off the heads of kids he catches spine on him and lines them up on his counter, our friend Michael chimed in. While I was skeptical of the Goatman story, I still made a note to avoid getting too close to the blue and white mobile home. I was glad to be separated from the trailer by an active railroad track that seemed as good as a brick wall in terms of inaccessibility. We moved on to lighter topics, then parted ways as the sun started to sink. A few nights after getting my Goatman primer, my family attended an end of summer bonfire at Robbie's house. He lived in a duplex which was about 100 yards from the train tracks with an area of meadow and brambles in between. Looking for the perfect marshmallow stick, I walked past the edge of his backyard when I saw something large moving through the bushes. I froze hoping my eyes were playing tricks on me. But as my eyes adjusted to the darkness, I got a better look. There was someone or something on two legs lumbering towards me with an erratic gait. It got a few feet closer before Robbie came up behind me, giving me a start. Did you find one? No, there's no good ones out here, I said, quickly heading us back towards the house. Once I got a few steps away, I turned back around and saw that the figure was crouched down in the grass a few feet away from where I had been standing. Despite it being the perfect fodder for my favorite summer activity, I never mentioned it to anyone, not until now anyways. The real horror came just a week later. After hearing the increase in Goatman gossip, several of the older kids in the neighborhood talked about paying him a visit. They boasted about taking along a single-use camera to snap a photo. I almost wanted to tell them what I saw, but they were notorious bullies and I didn't want to put myself in their line of fire. It seemed safest not to mention it at all. It wasn't long after they set out that they came back screaming, nearly hysterical. All they could say that was the Goatman had gotten Jeff. 
The initial commotion brought out a throng of concerned adults, but once they heard it was about the goat man, their concern turned to annoyance. The absence of Jeff, a repeat troublemaker whose family lived in the duplex next to Robbie, wasn't a rare occurrence and after a brief search of the area was conducted, everyone went home. His parents, who seemed equal parts of angry and worried, loudly let the neighborhood know he was in for it when he got back as they reluctantly disappeared back into their house. They found him the next morning. His headless body was front side down just a few feet from the edge of his backyard. The stretched sinew in his neck dangled out of his gore-soaked shirt collar like soggy raffia. Blood soaked the area around his body and streaked the grass in dribs and drabs, clear across the field and up to the train tracks. I feebly tried to watch the scene from the edge of the sidewalk, stopped from getting too close by a crowd of adults and his wailing mother. Even from a distance, I could smell the budgeting heat of the day mixing with the metallic smell of Jeff's blood. Quietly, I went back home and stayed inside the rest of the day. It definitely wasn't a story or a joke anymore. Later, my parents solemnly explained that it was determined that Jeff had been hit by a train and used it to reinforce the importance of avoidance of the train. Still, none of it seemed entirely right. How did people miss his body? Why didn't the train conductor stop or notice he had been hit or that he hit someone? Why hadn't they been able to find his head? The police had declined to investigate the other boys' claims of seeing Goatman at the trailer, but a few of the fathers in the neighborhood decided to pay it a visit. They found the single-use camera just outside the door, smashed to bits. The inside of the trailer was bare, empty cans of food and a sleeping bag being the only indicators it may have been used recently. But on top of the worn wooden shelf above the kitchen sink, they found a large rust-colored stain with red rivulets drying down the tiled wall and congealing into a pool on the counter. Ooh, Ooh. spooky. Yeah, I probably should have mentioned like a little little gore warning there, but you know, it's Halloween, so here we are. The goatman's gonna get you. The goatman's gonna get you. So he was murdered in that trailer. Yeah. No, he was hit by a train. Gary, yeah. according to the parents and the police, he was hit by a train and neatly decapitated as, <laughs> as you know, trains do. They neatly decapitate dogs, <laughs> neatly decapitate Robbie's. I think it was Robbie that died, right? Jeff. Jeff. Neatly decapitated Jeff. Robbie is still alive. There was a bunch of kids in that story. I know. So many names. Our last story comes to us from the book, Stay Out of the Woods, Strange Encounters, Volume 3, by Tim Lyons. This is a long one, so uh, buckle up. I want to tell you about when I encountered a two-legged beast back when I lived in Glenard in Maryland. The sighting occurred in 1998, and it's something I still think about daily. It scared the shit out of one of my kids so badly that we had no choice but to send him to see a therapist. When my son Ryan was in 6th grade, he became very passionate about lacrosse. The sport is huge in the state of Maryland and pretty much everywhere in the northeastern states. He had played it on and off ever since he was a little guy, but it was after he had hit his growth spurt that he realized that he could compete to be one of the best. He became so obsessed that he begged me to have a portion of the woods in our backyard chopped down so that he would have more room to practice. For his birthday that year, my wife and I bought him a goal to practice shooting on and a rebounder contraption to practice his passing. I didn't play lacrosse, but as I got older, I found myself wishing I had. Therefore, I wanted to make sure my son had all the tools to excel. It's probably a means for me to live vicariously through my kid, just as you see with so many other parents. But in general, I deeply admired how determined he was. I thought it would set a fine example for my two younger kids, Hannah and Dylan, to witness Ryan's work ethic pay off. Every day after school, Ryan would be out there practicing with his new gear until it was too dark to see. He was about to head inside the house one night when he said he saw a face looking at him from just behind the edge of the woods. According to my son, the face's skin tone was too dark to notice much of the details, but what he could see was a pair of horns. Their lighter shade made them more visible in the dark. If he were to be standing right near the lacrosse net when he saw the horns, it would mean there's probably about 60 yards of space between him and the woods. 
Whatever Ryan saw, it scared him enough to discourage him from going back there to practice the following afternoon, so he asked the gym teacher or some maintenance worker to let him use one of the school's lacrosse nets. All of this happened in the fall, which is the off-season for lacrosse, so he needed special permission to haul one of the goals out of the storage. That same afternoon, I strolled around the yard looking for clues regarding large animals or trespassers, but I didn't notice anything. I guess it was because I told Ryan that I didn't see anything that he ended up feeling comfortable enough to practice in the backyard the next day. Ryan got back to his routine, but maybe three or four days later, he came bursting into the house. Call the police! He demanded. There's something out there! He yelled at me, and it, and, it, and it was holding someone's dead dog! My wife and I hurried Hannah to take Dylan to the other room and distract him with the movie. We didn't want our kids to see their big brother in that panic state. Wait, buddy, hold on, I said calmly as my son walked over to pick up the phone. Who yelled at you? It did, he said. I know it's the very same thing I saw staring at me the other day. It has to be. It came running out of the woods at me while, while I was walking to gather the lacrosse balls. It seemed upset that I had shot a few of them in the woods. Maybe I hit it or something. So this monster, or whatever you call it, I said, glancing at my wife, hoping for aid. It had horns just like what you saw the other day. My son nodded. It was carrying the dead, bloody dog in, in one hand and a small axe in the other. It waved the axe in the air a few times, acting like it was going to swing at me, but it, it never did. It let me run away. Again, I glanced at my wife. She was at a loss for words. Usually she would be the first to roll her eyes at statements like this, but she could tell that Ryan was genuinely frightened. She was probably worried that a mentally ill man had intruded on our property and got aggressive with our son. Did they say anything to you? My wife asked. It was shouting in some language that I couldn't understand, said Ryan. It sounded like it could have been German or maybe Russian, something European. By this point, he seemed to be relaxing a bit. I think it helped that we weren't so quick to reject his claims. I believe that's how we should always respond to people who tell stories of encountering the unknown. We should call the police, Ryan said. It let me get away this time, but I don't think it would hesitate to hurt someone if, if it were angry enough. Someone needs to help make sure that that thing doesn't come anywhere near any of us. Go wash up, I said sympathetically. Your mother and I will take care of it. We ended up calling the non-emergency number, informing the authorities that there might be a sketchy individual in our area. We didn't want to tell him the extent of everything our son had said because, frankly, Neither my wife nor I knew how to communicate his claims. Anyhow, the police didn't reveal that there had been any other calls from our area, but I found myself wondering if some crazy guy could be hiding out in our woods. It was that night I could have sworn I awoke to a gunshot, which was something I had never heard before while residing in that neighborhood. It sounded like it likely came from a rifle, but since there was only one shot and neither my wife nor any of my kids told me they heard it after I asked them the next day, I had no way to verify that it wasn't part of my dream. The following morning, the doorbell rang. An older woman named Luann had the most worried expression on her face. She explained that she lived down the street and was going door to door, hoping that someone knew of her dog's whereabouts. When she held out the photo of her pup, Bruno, I shuddered as I recalled my son's claims from the previous night. After assuring Luann I'd be sure to contact her if we spotted her lost companion, I walked to my son's bedroom. Hey, buddy, I said, nudging his door open and seeing that he was still lying in bed. You know how you saw the crazy man carrying a dog last night? What color was the dog? Black and white, Ryan replied immediately without having to think about it. That was when I knew for sure something strange was going on. The dog in Luann's photo was indeed black and white. Sure, there was always a chance that it was a mere coincidence, but my instincts nagged that we were dealing with something highly unusual. I think my wife was in the shower during the encounter with the woman at the door, because I remember going straight outside to the backyard after briefly speaking to my oldest son. I was desperate to find anything at all that might shed some light on the mystery. I carefully eyed the grass around the lacrosse net and was slightly disturbed to see what looked to be dry droplets of blood. I first spotted them about halfway between the woods and the lacrosse net. Suddenly I felt an overwhelming frustration and anger. Whoever or whatever had approached my boy needed to be dealt with. It became apparent that the worst thing I could do would be let the intruder get away with his aggressive behavior. After grabbing an aluminum baseball bat from the garage, 
I walked back to the forest edge and stepped inside. The foliage was too thick with fallen leaves, making potential droplets of blood nearly invisible. So I continued in the same general direction of what I could find on the lawn. The little expedition was extra nerve wracking because I had never really stepped foot into those woods before. They were muggy and dirty, and there had been occasional rumors of vagrants camping out in them. Even though I carried a baseball bat in there, I wasn't hoping for any kind of violent interaction. I think I just wanted to make it known that I was more than willing to stick up for my family. I assumed some nutcase wearing a crappy plastic viking helmet approached my boy. At least that's what the rational part of my brain had hoped. The deeper I got into the forest, the muddier it became. And while I was focused on the ground trying to seek out the most solid terrain, I stumbled upon a dog collar. It was maroon colored and looked dirty enough to have been left in the spot for multiple seasons. But it wouldn't have made much sense to think about whatever in those woods could have been constantly stealing dogs. Indeed, something like that would attract far more attention, and the neighborhood would announce that there's a wild predator on the loose, right? I didn't know what to do other than tighten my grip on the baseball bat and keep moving in the same direction. I somehow just knew that I was on the right track. Whether it was a good thing or a bad thing was an entirely different debate. Eventually I ended up at a ravine that I had never been to before, and when I laid eyes on what looked to be a shelter of various articles of clothing, I knew I had arrived at my destination. By then it made complete sense how a villainous lunatic would be able to live undetected in that region. The area was difficult to get to and provided no reward for doing so. There was no breathtaking view, no clean water, nothing of any remote attractiveness. There would be absolutely no reason for anyone to venture out there, making it a near perfect habitat for a nutcase that steals people's pets for meat. Other than the wind, the place was absent of all noise, hinting that nobody was home. The place looked just like a homeless encampment that you'd see on the sidewalks of San Francisco or Los Angeles, and it smelled like urine, feces, and trash. The environment felt even more sinister as I noticed a large pile of bones not too far off from the filthy shelter. Shortly after that, I spotted a variety of what looked to be large arrowheads made of stone, all resting atop a tree stump. As I quietly stepped closer, I saw an axe leaning against the other side of the stump. It looked as though it could have been stolen from someone's garage. The sight of that axe was what made me 99.9% .9 sure whatever occupied that camp was the same psychopath who scared the crap out of my boy. It made me feel a burst of rage stronger than I had ever experienced. Without any further delay, I stormed towards the tent. Even though I was as angry as ever, please keep in mind I had no intention of actually hurting anyone. I just wanted to make sure that the crazy person knew damn well there were others around who wouldn't be afraid to teach him a lesson. What I wanted was for them to become paranoid enough to pack up and move somewhere further away. Before I knew it, I ripped open the door that was made of a bed comforter and was instantly stunned by the ugliest, most horrifying face and gut-wrenching wail. Within an instant, I felt so stupid for having ventured out there. My actions seemed so reckless, as though I had put my family at significant risk of losing me. I felt selfish going out there, merely trying to satisfy my ego and my primitive instinct to defend my family. Everything my boy said was accurate. I found myself wondering why he hadn't mentioned the black hair covered goatish legs that led down to a pair of hooves. Maybe he was so distracted by the terror from encountering the creature that he failed to notice some of the most distinctive features of the freak. The horns looked much more like they belonged to a ram rather than a man protruding from the human-like head. Another thing that slapped me across the face was this type of creature had inspired so many depictions of demons. i never been the most religious person, but this creature looked like it was something straight out of the pits of hell. Everything about it felt negative like it could do no good for the world. But when it collapsed onto one knee while lunging towards me, I felt the tiniest glimmer of sympathy. The creature clutched the back of its admin around the area where you'd find a human's kidney and unleashed another awful wail, this one from nothing other than sheer agony. Just when I thought the beast was about to wring my neck, it fell forward onto its stomach, unable to focus on anything other than the pain. I then connected the dots, realizing that I must have woken up to the gunshot that struck this beast. But the question is, who would have done it? My guess is that someone probably witnessed it trying to abduct their dog. 
The only thing that was keeping me around was the utter devastation from laying eyes on the creature. Right there on the spot, it obliterated my perception of our world. I don't even remember when or where I dropped my baseball bat, but I didn't even notice it was gone until I was nearly home. Although I felt a bit bad for the injured creature while watching it wail, those feelings quickly diminished when I looked at my wife and children. I got on the phone with the police and told them that I heard a noise coming from the woods, so I went to check things out and came across a vagrant who appeared to be fatally injured. I mentioned nothing about the horns, the hooves, the bone pile, etc. Since it was clear that the creature was severely wounded, I thought there would be a good chance that it would still be there when the cops arrived at its hideout. I met the authorities, along with a handful of EMTs, at the park's parking lot near my house. I determined it would provide the most efficient route to the creature's location while drawing as little public attention as possible since hardly anyone ever used the park. They had a couple of canine units with them, both looking eager to see some action. After speaking to a couple men for a few minutes, I pointed them in the general direction and headed home. It was while I was having coffee with my wife and children, quietly discussing the horror of what I encountered, when we heard not one but two gunshots. There was no question in my mind that they came across the beast's location, and hoped to God I hadn't got any of the responders killed. Tended to drive back to the park to see an update, I ultimately decided that it was best to stay indoors with my family. The police told me they would call the house once everything was taken care of. But eventually, the sun had set and I still hadn't received a phone call. After going for a night drive and noticing the parking lot was empty of police, I headed back to the house and called the precinct. I felt intense frustration when they informed me that they did not find anyone or anything at the camp. Then what would have been the reason for the gunshots, I demanded, only to be lied that no gunshots were fired. That bullshit made me so angry I slammed the phone back down on the hanger and broke it. I don't even think it was the blatant lies that got under my skin. It was the fact I wanted to know whether my family was safe or not. If that freak had possibly survived and was still on the loose, I needed to know so that I would no longer allow my son to practice lacrosse in the backyard. For months I checked the local police blotters and saw nothing was even remotely related to what I had encountered in those woods. It was a real tough spot to be in, and it ended up driving me crazy enough to move to another town. Yep. All that because the authorities didn't tell me what happened after locating the camp. I am very confident that the creature I encountered is what's known as the Goat Man. And it turns out, there have been many sightings around that region of Maryland. I would give almost anything to learn where that beast came from. Dun dun dun. <laughs> Goat Man. Goat Man. Goat Man. And that's it for the Legend of the Goat Man. What what a way to start off our Spooktober episodes. Now, I like this episode because even though the four urban legends we covered today were all similar, each one also brought something unique to the table. The Maryland Goatman was likely the first of its kind and was tied to a local research center. The Popelik Monster of Kentucky is by far the most dangerous legend we covered as it was the indirect cause of several deaths. Yeah, I don't like the name Popelik. That's the name of the creek, so yeah. I'm not sure where that the name for the creek came from, but, <laughs> you know, if you're a monster by a creek, you know, it's not your fault. Uh, the Lake Worth monster in Texas is the only true cryptid, or at least the only flesh and blood creature we've covered today with confirmed sightings and encounters, even if they might have been hoax. Plus, it was scaly, which we've never seen on any other version of Goatman. And the old Alton Bridge is haunted by the Goatman ghost, whose legend is rooted in the Jim Crow era of the South. So out of all the urban legends we've covered, which one do you think was the most interesting? I just like the uh like the one that the the story was about, just the goat man. Like just the goat, the man. goat man. Yeah. yeah. So That's like the more of the Maryland yes. one. Yeah. Yeah. I, I like that one because it's like it's a mutant from a lab. I like that <laughs> one, but I also really like the Popelik monster because it it was out of all these there these are all urban legends for sure. But the Pope Lake Monster is the only one that could have been remotely an actual cryptid or an actual creature and, you know, inspired the town to band together for a good old fashioned monster hunt. So I do tend to, it really brought the community together. I do tend to like the the ones that have the, the lore of like, um, you know, like turn off your lights, honk, and you'll see yeah, something. Yeah, no, that's, I do like that's the, literally every haunted bridge ever. We yeah. have Tilly Willie Bridge and it's... What was that one in Gravit? The, there's oh. one in Gravit where like, you see like oh, train yeah. lights or something. Yeah, you see lights, you see eyes, you yeah. see if you turn your car off and honk your horn, little the ghosts of the dead children will leave handprints right. on your window. <laughs> literally, 
like there's like 50 at least 50 in like every state of a haunted bridge of some sort and i will say in bella vista there's um it's not really a see something but there's a spot mm -hmm. it's supposed to it's supposedly uh indians the oh yeah, the Indian is. burial ground. Yeah. And <laughs> Another cliche. Like it look like visually, it looks like you're going uphill. But I, oh I think, yeah, I think scientifically, mm. it's not really going. It's uphill. An, it's an it's an optical illusion. Yes, and so when you put your car in neutral, you'll actually yep. that's also go uphill, and it's supposed to be Indians pushing your car. Yeah, that's that's tears. also a very common one. And, and like it's pretty wild though. You know, it is wild. You know, yeah, it yeah. does look like you're going uphill, but right. it's not. It's because of the way the background sits with the road and it's all that just, stuff. It's a it's a mind game. Yeah, you're yeah, kind of like sure. that. What is that? That tunnel that you walk the bridge. The little like the, yeah, the tunnel goes around you and it like throws off your yeah, you like the little oh, illusion. So much, yeah. yeah, but no, I, I do I do like the lore around these. I love urban legends. Um, some of this kind of reminds me of the melon head episode we covered, where it's just like freaks hiding in the woods. Yeah, so I, I really liked it. Oh, yeah. I wanted to give a shout out. I didn't write it in my notes. Most of the information I got today was from uh, J. Nathan Couch's Goatman Flesher Folklore. Um, he includes all the legends I mentioned with a lot more detail. And he also includes a lot more lesser known Goatman legends from around the United States. So definitely check out the book if you can. Hmm. Uh, I also wanted to give a shout out to Zach Sills. He's this uh, graphic designer uh, I've been working with. He's the brother of my guitarist from my band. He helped me separate the actual bird and the actual Snipe Hunt logo from our big square logo um, from our podcast cover art. So I can use the bird and the logo separately and like merch, hopefully down the line merch. But right now I'm using it for like YouTube thumbnails and stuff. So was think, it difficult or did it just look it, difficult? It, it, it just looked difficult he made it look because easy. he did it for free. So I guess it was super oh, easy dear. and he got it back to me within like 10 minutes. Thanks, so. Zach. Yeah. Thanks, Zach. We appreciate that. And uh hope to work with you in the future so if you need any graphic design done zach sills is your man you, you'll find him i'm uh, pretty sure he has a website his own website like zachsills.com so uh what are your final thoughts on the goat man i've always liked the goat man even before i was into this cryptid stuff yeah he's a lot of the cryptids have becoming more and more popular in goat man especially in but, part do buzzfeed Un unsolved in part because you know but you mainly he's just everywhere. think of religion Satan, yeah yeah you think of the, you think of the devil and we we yeah. learned the reason why that behind Which, that today i just always thought he looked cool he does look cool yeah. <laughs> that's why that's why Tenacious i'm wearing d in the pick of destiny yeah exactly thing. it's kind of like yeah that's why i'm wearing my little goat mask for my show i'm gonna be wearing like i'm wearing like a cultish robe and stuff but i'm wearing like are a, you gonna paint it no gonna i'm gonna paint? leave it black i'm gonna oh, okay. do total blackout oh, okay except I, under my little cult robes i'm gonna be wearing a like a black button-up shirt and a tie and so when I get too hot, I'll disrobe and I'll look really cool. It does look really cool. I've I've already modeled the costume. And I'm I think like, it'd be yeah. really cool if you did like the like a like a fur type, like a oh that would be cool. Main type. It's know. too late it's for that. I've already spent way too much right. money. On this. <laughs> so goat guys and goat gals, if you like, if you love or like the show, please give us a rating on whatever app you you use that'll let you leave a rating. Give us five, ten. 20, 50 stars. 1 million. 1 million stars if it lets you. And uh, leave a comment on why you like the show or if you hate it. No, you, you don't have to bother leaving a comment yeah. if you hate it. <laughs> no, you can. Uh, please follow us on social media. Send us a message about anything. We'd love to hear from you guys. We Even if it takes us two years to find it. <laughs> it only took us a year to find yeah. that one YouTube comment. <laughs> YouTube. And it was negative anyway. So. <laughs> Uh, we're on Facebook, Twitter, as well as the Gram, Reddit, YouTube, and even TikTok. The links to most of those are in the show notes of the episode. Gary, I still haven't seen you post a TikTok yet. I know. We're, we're going to go over this every episode. I know. And there's three weeks between no, every episode, so you've had Dude, all the time in the world. because as soon as I post one, we're going to go viral, and that's it. <laughs> we're going to become the most Skyrocket. famous yeah. paranormal that's podcast. It. That's it. Yeah. Take that, astonishing legends. Yeah. Check out our tiers on Patreon to see if you're interested in voting for future episodes and or the bonus content we have on there, including early access to the episodes via our raw and uncut versions, which are also unedited, so you get to hear us curse and mess up and all that fun stuff. Uh, a link to our Patreon page can also be found in the show notes. As usual, if you have a topic suggestion, a question, comment, criticism, or if you have a story about the goat man or anything else, please contact us on social media or email us at snipehuntpodcasts at gmail.com and let us know if you'd like to hear your story in one of our Encounters episodes.
All right, let's go ahead and end on the final joke. Oh, boy. <laughs> Gary's favorite. <laughs> Did you know that the Dutch have their own goat man that is actually very good at painting? I did not. Yeah, his name is Vincent Van Goat. <laughs> <laughs> do you make these? <laughs> or do you find them? No, no, I, I find them, but I, I had the goat man part. Oh, so. man. <laughs> you are welcome, Ugh. good sir. And as always, thank you all yes. for listening. Thank you. Armed with pointed horns and glowing red eyes, a true legend roams around bridges, in the woods, and even in the lakes of America. But he can also be found in ancient Europe, his image spawning countless monsters and religious antagonists. The iconography of this horned being is ingrained in human culture, and if the contemporary urban legends are any indication, won't be going away anytime soon. So next time you are legend tripping, be careful. Not just of your surroundings, but of the glowing red eyes staring at you in the darkness. Because what awaits you is frightening folklore. Once again, we want to thank you for listening to Snipe Hunt. Your listening has been noted and will be reported to the proper authorities. All audio used was done so under fair use. The music you have heard in this episode was composed by Mayu, Nature World 1986, and Festlian Studios. We'll continue to search for the unexplained and hopefully see you on the next hunt. <laughs>